What's up, beautiful people? Welcome to Joe's Productions. Today, we're taking a look at the Marshall Court and the impact of the Supreme Court case Marbury versus Madison. You might recall, during the administrations of Washington and Adams, political parties formed. Party! A lot of the division and debate took place from within Washington's cabinet. Hamilton was on Team Federalist, and Jefferson was on Team Democratic Republican. Eventually, the first party system would develop in the 1790s, and as you could see right here, these two parties had very different views about the power of the federal government and how the Constitution should be interpreted. For example, in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions were written. Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans argued a state could nullify a federal law passed by Congress felt to be unconstitutional. Well, in 1800, Thomas Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, was elected President of the United States, marking the first peaceful transition of power in the young republic. Now, you may think with the Democratic Republican party in charge that the power of the state governments will grow at the expense of the federal government but you <laughs> you you could not be more wrong while the federalists did lose both the presidency and control of congress in 1800 they still had control over the federal court system and while the democratic republicans were advocates of state rights the power of the federal government will dramatically increase as a result of decisions of the supreme court under john marshall john marshall was appointed chief justice of the supreme court in the last months of the Adams administration. Marshall would serve on the Supreme Court for 34 years, making him one of the longest serving judges in the history of the court. As you can see from this graphic, his 34 years of time on the Supreme Court far surpasses the average amount of time spent by most justices on the court, even by today's standards. And not to mention, back in the day, people did not live as long as Supreme Court justices typically do today. 34 years leading the court is a lot of time to shape judicial opinion in the young republic. So let's talk about the importance of the Supreme Court and in particular, the court under John Marshall. One of the most important cases of the early Republic was the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. Now it's not really necessary to get into all the details of the case, but you best know why it's important. The Supreme Court ruling in Marbury versus Madison stated that the Supreme Court has the power to determine the constitutionality of legislative and executive actions. Marbury versus Madison was in direct opposition of the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions because the case stated it was not the states who could determine the constitutionality of a federal law or action. Rather, the Supreme Court had the power to determine the meaning of the Constitution. This is known as judicial review. Judicial review meant the Supreme Court had the power to overrule actions of two branches of the federal government that are determined to be unconstitutional. For instance, if Congress passed a law, the Supreme Court could declare it was unconstitutional if the case made itself to the court. Or if the president did some executive action, like issue an executive order, the Supreme Court could also declare that act unconstitutional. The principle of judicial review affirmed in Marbury versus Madison dramatically increased the power of the judicial branch. Another case decided in the Marshall Court was the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. The case came before the Supreme Court when the state of Maryland attempted to tax a branch of the Bank of the United States. Remember, Hamilton and Jefferson disagreed agreed whether or not the Constitution gave the federal government the power to create a national bank. In the decision, Marshall argued that even though the Constitution does not mention a national bank, the Constitution did provide the federal government the power to establish a bank. In the decision of McCulloch versus Maryland, the court ruled the bank was in fact constitutional. Marshall used a loose interpretation of the Constitution in the decision, and the Supreme Court decided that the federal government had the implied power to create a national bank. Hamilton would love this. In the decision, Marshall stated that the power to tax involves the power to destroy. You can hit pause and read the rest, but basically, in the decision, the Supreme Court will also reaffirm and assert that federal laws took precedence over state laws. In short, in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland, the court used the doctrine of implied power to increase the authority and power of the federal government. They limited state rights in favor of the federal government. Another case that shows the increase 
increase in federal power was Gibbons versus Ogden in 1824. While the background of the case was to determine whether the state of New York could grant a monopoly to a steamboat company if that action conflicted with a charter authorized by Congress. But you don't really need to know most of that unless you're going to some fancy law school. What you need to know about the case of Gibbons versus Ogden is the court ruled the New York monopoly was unconstitutional. In doing so, the Marshall Court established the federal government had control over interstate commerce or trade that crossed state lines or trade between different states. In summary, Gibbons versus Ogden stated Congress has the authority over interstate trade, the federal government, not the states. The decisions of the Marshall Court established the judicial branch as the institution which determines the meaning of the Constitution and asserted federal laws took precedence over state laws. Now you might be thinking, who cares? I don't care. Why does any of this matter? Well, in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson is going to take steps to get rid of the Bank of the U.S. that the Supreme Court said was constitutional. Also, Andrew Jackson is going to openly ignore a decision of the Supreme Court, which sought to protect rights of Native Americans to their land. And in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt will try to pack the court with justices that were more likely to decide potential cases in favor of the New Deal. And finally, in 1954, the Supreme Court case of Brown v. Board of Education ruled that segregated schools were unconstitutional, but many states openly defied the Supreme Court decision and refused to integrate their schools. All of these foreshadowing conflicts between states and the federal government and the interactions between the judicial branch and other branches of government as well as state governments. Ultimately though, due to the decisions made under Chief Justice John Marshall, whoever sits on the court has tremendous power to shape decisions and laws in the nation, which makes who is elected president important beyond just the years they serve in the White House. As of September 2021, each one of the justices you see on the screen are currently serving on the Supreme Court. In the case of Clarence Thomas, he is still serving over 28 years after George Papa Bush left office, proving the impact of presidential elections and the court nominations. Now in our next video, I will examine the American system and the legendary Henry Frickin' Clay. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. Have a beautiful day. Peace.